We've been talking about a heart revolution the last, for I don't know what, month and a half, not quite two months, maybe. We've been talking about a heart rev- revolution. And what we're trying to talk about is radical love and radical obedience. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And it's taken us this long just to lay the groundwork. What's it mean to have a heart on fire for the Lord? So what we did is we laid the groundwork with our first few lessons. Let's go ahead and put up this next slide, Mike. So we laid, we laid the groundwork. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12 is the portion of Scripture that we've used as a foundational text every week when the lord gave instructions on how he wanted his altar and how he wanted his sacrifices to be consumed he says the fire is going to be on the altar and don't put it out and he gives instructions this is how what i want you to do this is how i want the animal this is the kind of animal i want put on it and then the next verse in verse 13 he reiterates he says make sure the fire shall ever be burning on the altar it shall never go out And what we're doing is we're comparing that to our walk with the Lord. We are living sacrifice. And so our hearts and our devotion to the Lord, that's the altar that the Lord's referring to, to New Testament believers. And the Lord doesn't want the fire to go out. Amen. Come on. The Lord doesn't want the fire to go out. Let's put this next slide up here. Let's just review. So finally, last week, we got through these four. We laid the groundwork. The Holy Spirit is the fire. We can't light our own fire. We're not the source of the fire. We're the sacrifice. When we live a sacrificial life before the Lord, you know, the Lord said that we got to die daily, or Paul said we got to die daily. But Jesus said, take up the cross and follow him. So we're the sacrifice, but the Holy Spirit is the source of the fire. We are living sacrifices. The fire, last week we talked about this, it needs stoked. And we discussed certain things that we need to do in our life to stoke that fire. And then we talked about the fact that our flame is contagious. Hallelujah. People want to get around believers that are on fire for the Lord. It's contagious. And then our next lesson, this is what we laid the groundwork for last week. Do you get it? And then let's put up the next slide. So we laid the groundwork. We're talking about David's devotion. And we talked about in today's economy, all the gold, all the silver, the timber, everything that he gave to build the temple, what that price would be in today's economy. And it was pretty radical, amen. And that was David's devotion to the Lord. Now, we'll get to Solomon's devotion uh, after tonight. I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but we'll eventually get to that because Solomon was the one that got to eventually build it. David prepared the way. David got all of the materials in place, but Solomon, his son, was the one that actually built it. But tonight... We're going to talk about radical love, radical devotion, and radical obedience. This is part of our theme. Radical love, radical devotion, radical obedience. And I want to put up Mark chapter 12. I think we've got that in there. Uh, Do we have that in there next? Yeah, Mark chapter 12. So we're going to talk about being a radical for Jesus tonight. And... I think when you look here in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, it pretty well sums up the kind of devotion that the Lord wants from us. Now, Jesus is answering the Pharisees. He says, um, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. He's one, verse 30. And he says, you're going to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. Now, he doesn't just end with all your, all your heart. Now, for me, I believe that when the Lord gets all of our heart, he gets everything else. He gets our soul. He gets our mind. He gets our strength. Because the heart is the core of who we are. David, who's the person we talked about last week, was a man after God's own heart. And because David was a man after God's own heart, he loved the Lord with his heart, soul, mind, and strength. So when you start talking about radical devotion, this is radical. I mean, how much more can we love the Lord than with all of our heart? (laughs) I mean, it doesn't get much more radical than that, right? All of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And in verse 31, and I'll allude to this a little bit tonight. I hope I can get to it. We'll see how it goes. 
But Jesus is talking about not just, you know, when we're radical for the Lord, not just our love for Him, but it is obedience to His Word. Because remember, God and His Word are one. So if you say, I love the Lord, you're going to love the Word. I love the Lord, you're going to love His commands. I love the Lord, you're going to love His direction for your life. So see, you can't, that's radical love toward the Lord. You can't separate the two. And then Jesus comes in and says, well, if you're going to say you love me, then you're going to have to love your neighbor too. So you can't separate the two on that one either. I love the Lord. You better love your neighbor. But you don't know what they did to me. Well, if you say you love the Lord, then you're going to love your neighbor. Now, remember, loving don't means, doesn't mean endorsing or condoning. But you've got to love them the way the Bible says you've got to love them. So basically what Jesus is saying is, I want you to love me radically. And this is what God wants. And the gauge in which you know if you're, really, or if you're really radically in love with the Lord is how well you obey His Word and His commands. Oh, Jesus. Let's put up this next slide. Radical. Now, today, we hear the word radical and we, we think he's an extremist, right? They're a right-wing extremist. Oh, they're a left-wing extremist, right? They're a radical. But radical really gets its roots in what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12. Paul was a radical believer for Jesus. Amen? Those New Testament apostles were radical believers for Jesus. They loved the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So when you look up the word radical, because some of you tonight go, yeah, you know, I love Jesus, but I'm not a radical. That don't make sense. Because if you love Jesus the way the word says you're supposed to, you're going to be a radical. Radical means a person who holds or follows strong convictions or principles. Do you hold strong convictions? Do you str hold strong principles? Well, the word convictions, I don't have this in the slides. You can jot this down. I kind of jotted this in my notes. Um, but convictions means fixed and firm in one's belief. So if you're a radical for Jesus, you're a person who holds or follows your strong beliefs. This is what I believe, and I'm firm in it. I'm not going to move to the left or to the right. I am firm in what I believe. I'm a radical. You know, in today's day and age in the church, well, that is the radical, somebody that actually obeys the word. Because people today, I'm a Christian, and everybody, everybody's a Christian. You know, and, and I hear this. And it just oh, it gets to me when I hear that. I'm a Christian. I might cuss a little. I'm a Christian. I love you. I might drink a little. I don't know. Being a radical, a person who holds and follows strong convictions, what's that mean? I'm firm in my belief, and I won't be swayed. I'm not a compromiser. I'm not lukewarm. I'm not somebody who says one thing and lives another. I live by my convictions. Now, remember, the, the word conviction is different than the conviction the Holy Spirit gives to you. Because when you're convicted by the Holy Spirit, that means that he brings it to the surface and he brings it to the light. So the Lord's convicting you about something. But when you have a conviction to the Lord, that means you're firm in your belief system and you can't be swayed. So you've got strong convictions and you've got strong principles. Now, the word principles means an accepted rule of action or conduct. This is what's kind of getting into the, I love Jesus and my life will reflect it. Come on, it's your conduct. Amen, come on. So it is an accepted rule of action or conduct, an accepted fundamental doctrine or a tenet. So basically, if you're a radical, you're just somebody who's obeying the word. That's really what that means. I'm a radical. It just means Jesus comes first. Amen. I'm a radical. I mean, so really when you think of the word radical, you know what that means? You're a Christian. That's all that means. And it's crazy because when you start using the word radical, people are like, oh man, that, who I don't. No, that, to me, that's just a Christian. Because let's go back to Mark 12, remember? If you're going to love the Lord, you're going to love the Lord. You're going to love all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And you're going to love your neighbor yourself. That's pretty radical. No, that's being a Christian. So I'm a person who holds or follows strong convictions or principles. I'm also a person who advocates for who 
I'm devoted to. I'm going to lift up Jesus. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to defend Jesus. Amen. Come on. I'm going to advocate for what I believe. And if the, if the, the Lord opens the door, I'm going to have the attitude that says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. I'm not ashamed. I'm going to advocate for Jesus wherever I get the opportunity. What's that mean, advocate? I'm going to lift him up. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to support and promote everything that's Jesus. Hallelujah. So, so we're talking about a, a, a heart devotion or a revolution. We're, we're talking about radical devotion. We're talking about radical love. We're talking about radical obedience. Well, let's put up this next slide. Does it, is this starting to make a little bit more sense now? I mean, you, you start talking about being on fire for the Lord, and you go, oh, yeah, man, that's, yeah, I, I'm not, I mean, I love Jesus. I mean, I ain't like that. I mean, I ain't like those, some of those people, you know. I, I don't know. To me, when I read the Word, that's just being a Christian. Are you all here tonight? How many would agree with me? So, so really, saying I'm a Christian, according to Scripture, doesn't mean you're a radical. Well, what's the problem? Why is today's terminology of Christianity more of a, well, I, you know, I, I, I believe Jesus lived and I trust that he died on the cross and he rose and I kind of I trust in that. And, I mean, that's all I need to do, right? I mean, the scripture says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ and God raised you from the dead. And I, I'm saved. I mean, that, that's all there is. Yeah, if you took that one verse out of context and that's all the Bible said about serving the Lord, the problem is, is we got a lot of other verses when connected to that that explains what that means in being on fire for the Lord. So, so we're talking about radical love. We're talking about radical devotion. We're talking about radical obedience. So here we go. Let's talk about this. Remember, I'm somebody who holds strong convictions and principles, and I'm an advocate for the one I'm devoted for. So what am I going to hold a strong conviction in, uh, for? Love. Love means a, a, a reverential affection and devotion to God. So when it comes to my relationship with the Lord, I'm, I'm going to be passionate. It's not going to be religion. It's going to be a relationship. I'm going to have an affection and I'm going to have a devotion. What does affection mean? Affection means, hear me, an emotional attachment in a sentiment. Now, I don't have a slide on that. But you can write that down if you're taking notes. It is an emotional attachment or sentiment. Now, I want you to hear me. You've heard me say this many times, okay? Emotionalism many times is not a response of the Holy Spirit. But when you truly love somebody, there's going to be an emotional attachment and a sentiment. I mean, when you love your spouse, shouldn't there be an emotional attachment to your spouse? When you, when you love your baby, right? You love your baby. Listen, I see how your parents love your baby, right? You love that baby. There's an emotional attachment to that baby, right? You would defend that baby. If somebody tried to harm that baby, you would defend that baby. You love that baby, right? You moms in here, that baby's flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. There's an emotional attachment. So anytime you truly love, there's an affection. Listen, there's going to be some emotion involved with your relationship with the Lord. I went, I went to a funeral today. Uh, a dear pastor that's, that's on our district, he retired um, four years ago, and he's 87. <laughs> he retired at, well, okay, he's going to be 87. He retired at 82. He made it all the way to 82 years old. And I remember I preaching for him about 20 years ago. And, and he's older, and, and, you know, their church wasn't very big. It's just a handful of people. And he had me come and preach shortly after I came here in 01. And, of course, he's well into his 60s then. And he played piano, and I remember showing up to the church, just a handful of people there, and I'm ready to preach revival. And he got up there behind that old wooden piano, and there was nobody else. There was no worship team. There were no musicians. He was, he was the worship team, just him behind that old wooden piano piano and the love that came out of him when he sang you'd have thought we were in the, in the middle of a mega church with a hundred person choir that man just loved 
Jesus and going to his funeral today and hearing his children that he raised talk about his devotion to the Lord and watching his wife there and just hearing the testimonies of people and that's all they talked about. They said, this man loved Jesus and they were given stories about how in his sickness that he's had recently been dealing with Parkinson's and it just, you know, it just, his body just kind of gave up and they said he could barely make it to the store, but he'd walk in and he'd talk to somebody and they would share a need with him. And here he is with Parkinson's, would stand right there in, the, in, in a lane at the grocery store and would pray for people. And that was the testimony of this man. People from the community, people that used to be in his church, people from his family. They said, I'll tell you what, this man loved Jesus. And that's what I want my testimony to be. I want people to say, Dennis Sanders has has a reverential affection. He has an emotional attachment to Jesus. That he knows what God brought him out of. And anytime he hears his name, anytime he hears somebody share their testimony, he gets a little tear in his eye and gets shook. Listen, I do. When I get around people and I hear their story about what God did in their life because I have an emotional attachment to that Jesus they're talking about, it ought to stir you up too. I'm telling you, when you come to church, nobody ought to have to get up on the platform of the church and pump and prime the congregation and to try to beg you to worship and to try to beg you to enter in or beg you to come to the altar or beg you to get involved with the sermon. I'm telling when you got radical love to the Lord, there's an emotional attachment to all things Jesus. Hallelujah. I've got a reverential affection and I have a devotion to the Lord. What does devotion mean? It is, it is a profound dedication and earnest attachment to a cause, to a purpose, and to a person. Well, we've we just been, been talking about that, that attachment to the person. But remember what I said earlier. God and His Word are one. So not only is God and His Word one, God in His cause are also one. You can't separate the two. So if you say, I love Jesus, you're going to love his cause. What's his cause? Seeing people saved. What's his cause? Getting the gospel shared to a dark world. What's his cause? Being a light in darkness, being salt of the earth. What's his cause? Being faithful and committed to the church. Finding your calling, doing it for the glory of God, not doing it for the applause of man, but doing it for the glory of God. That's his cause. Come on. So when you say you love Jesus, you can come across anything that talks about the Lord, that talks about his ways, that talks about his commands. And then you get in the New Testament and you talk about all the instructions of the church and how we're supposed to be committed to the church and how we're supposed to submit to certain things. And you know what? You can't separate the two. So if you say you love Jesus, you're going to love those things also. And and I'll say this because I'm a pastor, but we're living in a day and age now where people say, I love Jesus, I just don't love church. You can't say that. You can't say you love Jesus and not love his church because Jesus founded the church and the church is the body of Christ. And if Jesus instituted the church, organized the church, structured the church, gave instructions on how to run the church, if you say you love Jesus, you're going to love that too. Because remember, it is an affection and a devotion and a devotion means it is a dedication and attachment to a cause to a purpose and a person oh come on some of you are y'all here tonight this is what this whole wednesday series is about we're going deep we're finding out what radical devotion is all about we're finding out what radical love is all about you keep coming so that tells me you want a heart on fire for jesus And remember, I said this early, I'll say it again tonight. It's a whole lot more than somebody just laying hands on you. Take the fire, take the fire. No, 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 no. You've got to to do things in your walk with the Lord to get that fire going. And then when you look at your life and you evaluate your life and you begin to see some of the things that I'm talking about tonight, if you see an area in your life that's lacking in what I'm teaching, don't be condemned. Use it as a catalyst to get in the presence of God and say, God, I want my love to be radical. God, I want my devotion to be radical. I want my obedience to be radical. 
And like I've been teaching, and I just ended it last week, I'm a living sacrifice. And God, not my will, but your will be done. I'm telling you that God will do it in you. God will let your love be radical for him. Hallelujah. But let me say this before we move on to the devotion. Not everybody gets emotional. And, and I know sometimes us Pentecostals get accused of getting too emotional. And, and, and I get it. We call it emotionalism, right? We think that if we get emotional, it'll bring the Holy Ghost. No, I'm emotional because I got the Holy Ghost. Two different things. I don't come to church and kind of pump it up with emotion, hoping God will bless it. No, my emotion comes from my love for the Lord. My emotion comes because I've spent time in the quiet place, in the secret place. And so when I'm here corporately, it's just an outflow of who I am privately. Come on, y'all getting this? So, okay, we got radical love, then we got radical devotion. Well, what's devotion? It means a profound dedication. It is a dedicated loyalty or affection. Are you devoted to the Lord? Is your dedication profound? Are you loyal to Jesus in all things Jesus? Remember, it is his purpose, it is his cause, and it is his person. It is his church. Are you devoted to the church? Are you devoted to God's commands? Are you devoted to God's will in your life? Well, if you want a heart revolution, you better be. But what about obedience? Well, obedience is dutiful or submissive compliance and it is the practice of obeying now let's 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 put up this next scripture and and i'm going to explain this here in just a second we're going to find this put up this next slide so i think when we get it okay and we're going to talk about the difference between david and king saul i think when we get it We will love the Lord, I want you to hear me, for who he is. Our love for the Lord is not going to be based on what he does for us. And I think that's where a lot of us in church miss it, is because, man, we're doing great as long as he's answering my prayers. We're doing great as long as he's doing what I want him to do. But when things go different than the way I want them to go, are you still going to love the Lord? If life doesn't go as you expect, you're still going to love the Lord? If your plans don't work out, you still going to love the Lord? See, this is what radical love's all about. I love him for who he is. Job was faced with this kind of devotion. And when Job lost everything, and his wife even said, you lost it all, curse God and die. He said, I'm not going to speak like a foolish person. The Lord gave it, and the Lord can take it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we're going to love the Lord for who he is, not for what he does. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't do anything because we talked about that in an earlier lesson. He does exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think. It's it's extravagant. God's blessings in our life are extravagant. But at the core of my devotion to the Lord, it's not for what he does or for the benefit. It's because of who he is. See, when you pray, before you even get to petition. Before you even get to, here's my laundry list. Try just loving on God for who he is. Seriously. Most of the times, us Christians only pray in a time of crisis. When there's a need. And there's something we need to ask God to do. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We ask, we receive, we seek, we find, we knock the doors open. But when Jesus gave the model prayer... What's the order of the prayer? Long before we get to give me this day my daily bread, there's my father. What's father represent? It represents a relationship. It represents an emotional attachment. My father. Who art in heaven, holy is your name. There's times that, that I've prayed, and I hope you do the same. That sometimes I don't even get it. I don't even get to the give me this day my daily bread. 
Because I got so caught up in my Father who art in him and holy is your name. And that's radical love. That is your love based on who he is, not what he can do. Your prayer life needs to be that way. Your commitment to church needs to be that way. Your commitment financially to your offerings and your tithes need to be that way. Because where your money is, that's where your heart is. And I think if God's got your heart, he's got your money. And when it comes time to give, when it comes time to tithe, you're not crying a tear of pain. (laughs) You're crying a tear of joy, saying, oh, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my provider. I'm giving this to you willingly, God. Because that's what Paul said when Paul addressed giving. He said, don't do it drudgingly, but be a cheerful. That's an emotional attachment to your obedience to the Lord. That's radical love. It doesn't make any sense. Come on. So I think that's where, where we need to be once we get it. Because once we get that, God will get our devotion. So once God gets our love, he gets our devotion. Once he gets our devotion, he gets our obedience. Does that make sense? Once God gets our love, he gets our devotion. Once he gets our devotion, he gets our obedience. Because some of you in here, and I've pastored long enough to vouch this through experience. I've seen it. It's our human nature. Some of you are having a hard time with your obedience to the Lord. Go back to the core of your walk with God. I think that if God gets your love, he gets your dedication and he gets your obedience. Because it ain't going to be hard for you to obey a God you're radically in love with. And I think this is why this series is so important. It's going to open that up to you and let you understand that some of you struggle with obedience. And we're going to talk about this here in 1 Samuel because you're not, I can't judge you, but at least according to this portion of Scripture, King Saul couldn't obey God's command. He just couldn't. When it it came time for him to truly obey the Lord, he just couldn't. But David didn't have a problem with it. Because David was a man after God's own heart. Saul wasn't. Is this making any sense? See, there's a stark contrast between David and King Saul. David learned to love God at a young age. David learned to love God as a shepherd boy that his brothers were embarrassed about. His father didn't even want to acknowledge when the prophet showed up to anoint the new king. But David was out as a shepherd boy, being a shepherd, protecting those sheep, and out worshiping the Lord. A lot of those songs in the book of Psalms were birthed during his time as a shepherd, out just singing before the Lord. So David cultivated that love relationship for God early in his life. He was a man after God's own heart. We learned that last week. And because of that love, he was devoted to the Lord. He was devoted to God. To God, He was devoted to God's laws. He was devoted to God's ways. He was devoted to God's commands. Because remember, you can't separate those. If you say you love the Lord, you're going to love His laws. You're going to love His ways. You're going to love His command. You're going to love His voice. All those things come together when you say you love the Lord. His, and His obedience came from that. But not King Saul's. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 15... This is the chapter before God has to anoint a new king. The reason why God had to anoint a new king is because King Saul proved by his what? His obedience. That he wasn't a king after God's own heart. So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, the the first real true test of his leadership was put to the test. And so God said, listen, I've got a job I need you to do. And what I want you to do, the Amalekites are the enemies of Israel. and They're surrounding the nation. He said, listen, you need to take them out. And so these are my instructions. These are the instructions of the Lord through the prophet. I want you to go and destroy everything. I don't want you to spare anything. I, I want you to slay everything. Man, woman, child, wow. Now you learn later in scripture. Now we spiritualize that in the New Testament. But there's a reason why the Lord did this in the Old Testament. It was because he understood generations later 
that if those enemies were kept alive, they would continually keep attacking Israel and attacking Israel and attacking Israel and their idolatry and their foreign gods would seep into the nation of Israel. And that's why the Lord said, you need to remove these nations. And so God tells King Saul, okay, you're going to be my king. You're my man. The people wanted you. So I'm going to anoint you. And so when you go in here, I want you to do this and take out all the animals kill every single one of them so that's the command of god and you can read going to verse eight i'm not going to bore you with those verses but he continues to give you some instructions but then verse nine let's put verse nine verse nine reveals his heart and he just couldn't obey he just couldn't obey because he was a man that was not after god's own heart and the bible says but saul and the people Spared Agag in the best of the sheep. Now notice this. He was selective in his obedience. Oh, I could preach on that. How many times are we selective in our obedience? Now, Lord, that's a tough, that's a tough one. Now, this one I can do. <laughs> but but because I'm going to benefit from it. And that's why Saul couldn't obey the Lord is because he was going to benefit. So, so if I keep King Agag alive, he's got influence with other nations. He's probably got riches. And I'll keep, you notice, he doesn't destroy the worst. He keeps, or he doesn't destroy the best. He keeps the best. Oh, come on. I hope, hope you're seeing this through the lens of your walk with the Lord. Because when the Lord commands for you to do something or the Holy Spirit leads you to do something or you're reading Scripture and it's some tough portions of Scripture. You can't be selective. And I believe that if our heart is truly passionate toward the love, we're on fire for the Lord and we love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're going to do what's right, even if it doesn't benefit us. And Saul didn't. I'm going to keep the king. I'm going to keep the animals and all the lambs and the fatlings and the oxen. That was good. I'm not going to destroy them. But the vile things, you know, I was, it, it's funny because if, if the Lord spoke to us and, and said, I want you to bless this brother with something. I remember last year when we were looking at this property over here. Now, a lot of you have come since then, but we were looking at this property over here where the, where the extra parking lot is. There used to be a house there. Those who've been here long enough, you remember. And uh, there was a man that was... Uh, living in the house and he was uh what, what's the word I'm, yeah he was squatting and he was an addict and jovi and i went over and we poured into him we ministered to him we ended up taking him to a rehab place down in linton and the next day he was back there passed out and i went over and ministered to him again and jovi and i spent probably two hours that day talking to him uh no food the only clothes he had was what was on his back. The Lord spoke to me and Jophie and said, I want you to bless him. And so I said, what size shoe you wear? And he told me, I said, I wear about the same size as me. And in my flesh, I said, well, man, you got spare shoes. Just go home and pick a pair out you never wear. I'm just giving my story, Right? Not that anybody else in here would think that thought, but. And I'm leaving the house because I'm like, well, listen, if you say go to the office, we got a shower in the office, go over there, get cleaned up, take you a shower. Pastor Angie's in there, Angie's a nurse, and his feet were all soared up and, and stuff. I said, we'll, we'll look at your feet and we'll get you cleaned up. And uh, so I went to the house and I went down in, in my basement where I keep my shoes. And the Holy Spirit was like, is this gift going to cost you or are you going to give him what you never wear? I took my favorite pair. Hadn't had them but probably four months. Hardly warm. It took them. You know, when the Lord asks us to do something, 
Or we're going to say, okay, God, whatever you tell me. Now, that's just a pair of shoes. Okay. Uh, some of you might say, well, that's simple. Well, what happens if you're sitting in a service and we're receiving a special offering for missions and the Holy Spirit says, boom, puts an amount on your heart and you're like, oh, I rebuke you, Satan, man. Don't you dare say that. Speak to me. <laughs> well, the Lord tells you to do something pretty radical. You go over and get right this ought you got with this brother in church and go over there. I want you to get this right before church is over. Oh, Lord. It'd be a whole lot easier if I got right with somebody that I really don't have issue with. <laughs> Come on, and this basically what's going on here? Saul's like, eh, you know, I'm going to hold on to the vest. Well, let's go to the next verse. So here the command was given in verse 3. The act of disobedience was committed in verse 9. And then in verse 13... When confronted by the prophet Samuel, who's following up his obedience. Well, let's see how things went. I gave you the word of the Lord, and let's see how things went. Saul lies. He says, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I perform the commandment of the Lord. Now remember, saying you love Jesus and obeying his word, you can't separate the two. And I think this is when the true test of our devotion is put to the test. What are you going to do? So he lies about it. Go to verse 20. So he lies about it in the next few verses. He's going, oh yeah, we did this and we did this and we did this. And once again, he comes back in. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me and I brought back Agag, the king of Ammon, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Go to the next verse. Verse 21. And Samuel said, or verse 22, he says, Has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Would he rather have you do that than just simply obey the voice of the Lord? You've got to understand, because his obedience was selective, what he did is he twisted the command of God. Oh, yeah, we, we made sacrifice. He didn't tell the full truth, though. Oh, yeah, we made sacrifice with the worst of the animals. We, kill, we, we killed all the people, but we kept the king. And so he's selective and he's like, oh man, we don't know. And the prophet says, so you think God's pleased by your works? So you think God's pleased because you did a little, a little part of the command, but you didn't obey the whole command. You did some things. And he says to obey is better than sacrifice. How many times have we thought that our good works was a reflection of our love to the Lord. How many times have we thought, well, listen, I do this, and, and, and I do that. And we get this religious spirit about us, and we become a Pharisee, and we're like, well, I do this, and, and I do that, and I do this. Listen, I've seen people through the years that are like that, and they'll, the moment you cross their path, they'll cuss you out like a sailor. But I do this, and I do that, and carry my Bible to church, and I come to church, and I'm devoted. I never miss a service, and... And I'm faithful in my giving and, and I bring my sacrifice and, and to the Lord. And, and God's like, no, 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 no. I want obedience. I don't want these external works that you think impress me. Pastor, are you saying that we shouldn't be? No, 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 no. This is what I'm saying. The motivating factor behind why you do what you do is not to get God's attention or love. You do it because of your love. Big, big difference. And I think that if some of us can get to that place in our relationship with the Lord, then when it does come time to obey, see, King Saul had a hard time obeying because God didn't fully have his heart. But David had no problem obeying because God did. Am, am I making any sense in here? Are you getting this? We've heard this scripture through the years. Come on, anybody been in church a amount of time? They've heard this scripture, to obey is better than sacrifice. 
And it's funny how when we become selective like King Saul, it's like, oh, no, Lord, I, I, I can't really do this. But look at these other things I'm doing, man. I mean, I know the Holy Ghost told me in my prayer closet this morning that he wanted me to do something that, boy, my flesh don't want to have to do. Oh, no, I'm not apologizing. Mm -mm. No, I'm not getting this right. Oh, no. No, Lord, not that pair of shoes. <laughs> how about this, Lord? How, how about I do this? You know, I think sometimes when I see people go overboard, um, you know, a new term you hear today is love bombing, you know. How many have heard that term? It's kind of a new, it's, it's, a, it's a modern day term, love bombing. It's, it's like over the top expressions of devotion and love, not because it came from the heart, but it's trying to impress somebody. Um, if you study human behavior and you study narcissistic type of behavior, they'll do that in relationships. They'll love bomb somebody, not because they really love them, but they don't want to lose them. Does that make sense? I see that on Facebook all the time. People, people love bombing others. And I call it Facebook footsie, but, you know, it's... <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Y'all learned a new term tonight. I made that up, by the way. I didn't read that anywhere. <laughs> Facebook footsie. See all this devotion online, and you're like, I'm, and you're like I know them privately. That ain't them. I know what they said about that person in private and they're love bombing them on Facebook. That's Facebook. For, you're just trying to look good in front of everybody. I know what you said about them in private. I regress. Change subjects. <laughs> so the, that's what we do. Oh, God, but I did this. And, oh, I'm, we're love bombing God. Oh, God, I know I didn't do the thing you really asked me to do, but I did this. I did this. And that's when the prophet cut to the heart of it. He said, no, 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 no. God's not impressed with that. If you really love the Lord, you'd obeyed what he told you to do. Specifically, exactly how he told you to do it. Go to verse 23. Are y'all getting this tonight? I can't believe what time it is. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Y'all having fun tonight, right? Come on. <laughs> y'all going to go home tonight and go, Facebook footsie. That's cool, huh? Facebook <laughs> footsie. Man, Facebook footsie. I'm going to copyright that. Amen. <laughs> and then he really gets deep. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. What's rebellion? I disobey the Lord. What's witchcraft? Witchcraft is control. That's why witchcraft is such a sin in Scripture. It's control. You know, when you think of witchcraft, what do you, think? you think of seances, you think of, you know, potions, you think, what is it to control somebody's mind? And so when we rebel, we're controlling the situation. And God is like, no, no, when you obey, you're not in control. When you rebel, you are. When you are selective in how you choose to obey me, you're controlling the situation. Man, that's some deep stuff. That's why um, when it comes to relationships, and Joven and I are big on this, and she, listen, she's, she's done so much study in, in, through her doctorate about this, but when people are in relationships and you've got someone in the relationship that is a controlling partner in the relationship, they don't really understand what love is. When somebody tries to control someone in the relationship, that's not really, that's witchcraft, that's control. You, you shouldn't try to, let the love of the person you're in a relationship with, let it be organic and let it come from their heart. Because if you're controlling someone's love, it's not genuine. I wouldn't want to be in a relationship, and I'll tell you, definitely with Jovi, well, she wouldn't allow it anyway. <laughs> she made that clear real quick up front. <laughs> but to get from her what I wanted in the relationship, if I had to control her, I wouldn't want that because that means her devotion to me it's not, it's not because she really loves me. Now, I might be in charge of the relationship. I'm going to control everything you do. But, but I want Jovi's love for me to be true. Come on, y'all listen to this. So witchcraft's control. 
And Samuel's like, you don't control the commands of God. If you love the Lord, you don't control the situation. You do what he told you to do exactly and let it come from a heart because you love the Lord. In stubbornness. <laughs> I know nobody in here is stubborn. And I'm like, ooh, I've never, I've never struggled with stubbornness. We've all struggled with it. Ain't nobody in here, when God's confronted you to do something you didn't want to do, you weren't stubborn, at least for a little bit. At least maybe a day or two. Or a month. Or a year. Or longer. Right? Come on. But that's idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord's going to reject you. This is basically what God was saying. I can't have a king over my people who doesn't have a heart after me. Because when you lead the people, your decisions are always going to go toward what you benefit from it rather than what I want from my people. Now look at verse 33. Now I'm going to talk about devotion. So the prophet Samuel, after dealing with this exchange, now he tells Saul, you've lost the kingdom. You lost the kingdom. And God's going to have to find somebody that truly loves him. And that's when David, okay, the next chapter, that's when David is appointed king, right? This is devotion right here. Samuel <laughs> took the sword of Saul, pulled it, pulled it out of his belt. And could you imagine the king? Can you imagine Agag right there? He's watching this exchange go down, and he's like, oh, this ain't looking good for me. This ain't looking good. This ain't looking good. This ain't looking good. And the prophet pulls the sword out of Saul's belt and turns around and cuts him to pieces. Hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord because he was so radically in love with the Lord that his obedience was going to have to follow Saul's disobedience. And we might say, man, that is pretty radical. Yeah, it's pretty radical because that's what God told him to do. That's radical love. That's radical dedication and devotion. That's radical obedience. Am I, come, am I making any sense in here tonight? Come on. I, I know this is tough tonight. But God's radical in his love for us. You think the prophet taking a sword out and killing that king was radical? Jesus hung naked on a cross. And said, I'll die like a slaughtered lamb because of my love for sinful people. That's how radical his love was for you. So when it comes time for the Lord to say, hey, I want some radical love. I want some radical devotion. I want some radical obedience. Go back to the cross and look at the cross and look at the price that Jesus paid for your salvation. When you get it, and that's what I said last week, when you get that, mm -mm -mm, you'll become a radical. Hallelujah. When you get it. His love, His grace, His forgiveness, His goodness. It'll give a radical response from us. Let's, let's put this quote up here. When you finally realize it isn't about cutting off sin, it's about loving God so much your desires to sin no longer exist. That's why some of you keep struggling. And, and I'm with you. Okay? Just because my struggles might not look like your struggles don't mean that we don't all struggle. Some of us bigger than others. But all of us struggle in one area or another. And the problem is, is we, 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 we try to cut it off. Oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm, I, and then what happens? You go right back to it. What we need to do is take a different approach to it. Is lay down our life before the Lord and, and, and have, heart, have God give us a heart revolution. And I believe that when the Holy Spirit does those supernatural works on our heart, what he does is he removes our desire for that sin now. He, he removes, because our devotion for the Lord outweighs anything that would stand between us and God. Come on, are you getting this? Some of you in here that are struggling, take this approach. And watch those things in your life you keep struggling with. Watch you get the victory over it. 
This is the kind of devotion we got to have before the Lord. Let's go back and reread this as we're winding down. Mark chapter 12. Let's reread this. Okay. Okay, we read it to begin it, to begin the lesson. I gave you the meat. Now let's sandwich it with this other piece of bread and let's see if it now makes sense now after what I just shared. Jesus said the Lord's your God. He's one Lord. Look at verse 30. Here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That's the first commandment. Verse 31, you love your neighbor as your son. Is this making any more sense to some of you in here tonight? 